I will ask Michi questions to avoid that everyone maybe has the same. Um, so we, I will we do some Q and A each other we two, and then maybe some of your questions are already answered. And at the end, then we have time for anything that is interesting you about um, Michi and um, what he's doing here and how he came here. So. First question to you, Michi. <laughs> Your background, you already mentioned in the beginning shortly, but maybe you can give us a little bit more uh, more crisp about what you did um, and how you came here. Absolutely. So I started studying mechanical engineering at ETH back in 2011. Um, yeah, bachelor, ordinary program. I focused a bit on uh, process engineering in the um, like third year of the bachelor uh, program. Uh, then I went one year um, to the British Isles, so I did a exchange semester in Dublin and uh, an internship with Caterpillar uh, Engine Manufacturing Salvaging in the UK. Um, this was part of the Unitech exchange program that you might have heard of by chance, and uh, which I can recommend <laughs> just to be uh, in a, uh, to promote this a bit. And yeah, after this, I started my master's at ETH. Uh, this was together with the Onders group at IDSC, so with the engine control um, systems group, how to essentially make uh, the future of mobility more efficient, uh, more reliable, um, mainly many days on the test bench to, to get the data, to, to run your new control scheme that you um, want to, to implement. And yeah, it's been an interesting time. And probably I'm already getting to, to answering further questions now, but uh, I think it makes sense to proceed. Um, at the end of, of the Masters, I kind of had this decision ahead of me, whether I wanted to stick with automotive um, sector or not. And to me, it was not that convincing anymore at that time. I mean, it was interesting during the studies. Um, I still am fasc fascinated by um, automobiles and, and how what you can do uh, also with, with the control systems involved. Not so much how you can cheat, but um, you, I think you get my point. And um, yeah, then I kind of had to look for the first job and uh, I didn't want to move to Stuttgart or anywhere. So try to change the sector a bit there. Good. Um... So it's actually directly leading to my next question. Why you did start at Optune next to the fact that we are based in Vietcon? Um Well, yeah, as I just mentioned, it's really close. Um, I mean, I did have other offers on the table, which also could have been interesting, but I decided for Optitune mainly because I got the feeling during the interviews um, that you can do really diverse uh, work here so you will have many different topics on your desk um, you you have to be a bit of a um, generalist instead of specializing say on how to do cat work how to be a designer um, for hydraulic systems or whatnot um, matlab um, auto coding routines and, and and so on and so forth so all the other applications were really kind of focused on, on one specific topic and me as a uh, with the first job ahead of me I kind of wanted to find out still um, what really is kind of what motivates me what is my field of interest in, in business life so I got the feeling that Optitune could offer me this and it exactly held true so um, yeah that's Say the main selling point apart from what mark obviously presented before i mean it uh, might have struck you as well that is that there is quite some uh, application areas around and quite some interesting technology here within of the two mm -hmm. um so yeah you started you found out some things what you were actually 
or doing every day? What are your tasks now? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, the mechanical engineers among you probably had this um, CAT um, Annex uh, course in the first semester. So you got to know what CAT is and how it works and what you can probably do with it. But I, if you the same as me, you probably never use it again after this. Probably for some small project, probably during an internship, fair enough. But you never really got the hang of it. So when I first started here, I was tasked to kind of dig into CAT. Um, we have SOLIDWORKS as a um, solution here. And I mean, this took me a few months to really also understand how technical drawings are made, what are the implications uh, when you change tolerances to, to, to be narrower and whatnot. Um, so this is one of the tasks that I did intensely in the beginning and I'm still doing as a product development engineer. Um, essentially, when there is some new idea around on how to solve uh, uh, an open issue with a customer, of course, somebody needs to sit down and draw it and, and design it and we have specialized CAD engineers that do the more complex parts like um, process equipment, complex machines, um, which is also more involved than say that wouldn't be my first choice uh, on how to spend my day, um, but it's fair enough to have the occasional day where you just do CAD work. So this is the one thing. Um, then, as I have a background in control system, I have the main responsibility over all control development within Optitude. So, we do mostly do PID systems, um, but right now we're also looking into other options like uh, iterative learning control or MIMO system control, LQ key, LTR systems. So, this is um, coming because we do see potential there as well. Um, the electronics engineer might know LMS filters and whatnot. So this is another field of application that keeps me busy uh, for, for, for several days a month. Um, so this is kind of the two broad topics. And obviously then you have your ordinary work. I mean, you need to, when you design something, you need to source it. So you need to be able to have a, a talk with the supplier, get feedback about achievable tolerances. You need to be able to come up probably with a quote already if you're in really early design and supply chain is not involved so you need to establish or work for the project manager to establish a business case um, you need to talk to the electronics engineer on what he needs to do uh, in order to make the product run so it's also a bit of physics involved to get a voice coil motor most efficient and to get a sensor signal um, in, a, in a decent way to talk to the firmware engineer and the hardware engineer, electronics engineer about what um, ADC resolution you need and so forth and so forth. So it's, it's really diverse in that sense, as I already stated. Good, so we have some like clusters of things you do. Um, maybe there are some, some small things you do every day. Maybe you can give us a insight what a typical day looks like as an example absolutely so uh, i mean you, you have uh, team meetings obviously you need to be able to to, to exchange with your colleague uh, i can probably get the example of today i had to be here in here really early like six in the morning <laughs> this is not an everyday day but it happens every now and then uh, because today we are producing uh, the first bigger amount of samples together with our production um, staff. So there you need all, I mean, I needed to be there in order to uh, give them guidance on how to do this. Um, after this, I um, repaired some mirror that came back from a customer broken um, and I needed to figure out what is actually broken, kind of troubleshooting a bit, working for marketing and sales um, department to, to uh, to solve uh, a return merchant uh, authorization. Um, then I had a chat with supply chain on how to source new parts in that we direly need in order to proceed with the project and whether we could speed up the delivery a tiny bit or not. And yeah, this afternoon I have a meeting with uh, 
one of our customers on on a new idea they have. So I was tasked um, to join this meeting together with the head of engineering in order to to play the role of uh, expert um, inside this meeting. Oh, it's, um, but there is also say uh, days where you just have to do documentation and you and you kind of um, have to fill in uh, internal co incoming quality control sheets for the quality department kind of since you did a drawing and you source the parts now you all also need to check whether it's actually any good or not so this needs to be documented in some way such that you can release it for production for mass production and yeah you also have these days or writing an engineering report but um, they are usually um, not that often and this is something I really like here so I mean you you're not just writing technical documentations all the time it's a task that you have to do but it's it's rather sparse okay well then we just uh picked a very good day to fill you with another two hours of webinar. <laughs> <laughs> um, good. Uh, maybe you can tell me the what is your most exciting project so far, mm -hmm. which you did here. Um, this is difficult to answer, really. I mean, uh, there is quite some projects that have been around. Um, to me, it's probably the latest pixel shifting device with it. Uh, we started this development one year ago, and now we are producing in mass quantity. Like so, there it has really been interesting in the sense that you needed to question every cent. I know when I was studying, this is not what I really wanted. Or, or felt like this could be something interesting, but I can tell you it, it's kind of rewarding if you if you if you're the responsible design engineer to to come up with a solution for a problem at the lowest price, <laughs> and if you actually achieve to to even beat your um, your your goal that has been set to you. So to me, this has been the most exciting project in the in this sense because we really had some groundbreaking discussions on how to process uh, certain things, whether uh, a feature is needed or not, or whether we could come up with a different solution, which we actually did in the end, and which also might lead to a patent. I think this is a topic of ongoing discussion. Okay. Um, good. Any like other successes you had or something you want to mention, which you're proud of? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we have um, the odd good day <laughs> after loads of uh, troubleshooting and problems that doesn't seem to um, end. Um, so we, we recently decided to go ahead um, with a, another mirror design, which is more targeted toward uh, the LiDAR application that you saw with um, Mark Ventura's presentation lately, uh, just before. And I think the, the kind of uh, first prototype worked quite well. Um, we have some issues outstanding, so there is work ahead of us. Um, but I think it has been a success that we kind of could prove that we can increase the um, speed of the mirror quite significantly and does essentially enable us to, to be designed in into, an, uh, into a LiDAR system. Okay. Didn't know that about this news. <laughs> um, you also mentioned already some things, um, but maybe you can go a little bit more into detail about what things you love um, in your job. Yeah, I mean, I already said that it's. I, I like the diversity. Uh, this is also what I was uh, looking for. Um, I mean, I'm not. I'm, I, don't, I don't have the, the possibility to give you advice about 
what it generally would look like as an engineer because I only work since two years myself and I only work at Optotune so far so it's difficult for me to, to really give you advice um, with regards to yeah Optotune is really special or no it's it's the same with every engineering company but I think and this is um, just my opinion that within Optotune there is quite some openness to uh, new technology. So for example, we, we had once a, a chat about using um, oil that is laden with ferrite particles in order to have some uh, new actuator and whatnot. I mean, we have the electroactive polymer, which is kind of a, a specialty product of us, but can solve really many problems um, that our customers face or we can offer solutions to our customers with this technology. So I think um, Optotune kind of is uh, a technology think tank um, and this makes your everyday life quite interesting. I mean, we also have quite some uh, physics students or PhDs here. Um, they, they run them CMAX um, optical models and whatnot. And, um, but also on, on sensor systems and whatnot for electronics engineers or hardware engineers, um, how to actually yeah, design something. I think there's quite some leading edge technology and sometimes it's also bleeding edge then, but uh, we, we try to stay with the leading. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe some awesome some things about interaction um, I mean you also mentioned that you have different meetings different different projects um, customers but how is it in general to work together within the team what would you say is there special to mention I mean um, I found it quite astonishing how, how the overall public kind of had this issue with going um, to remote work because for, for us, since we have, um, say, our, we have also engineers in Slovakia, the whole production of my department that I work in is in Slovakia. Um, so we are used to, to using Microsoft Teams and to use OneNote, to use whatever SharePoint drives to interact with our application engineers and customers. So I think this kind of um, didn't came as a huge issue to us. Um, uh, so this is one part where we actually are quite advanced in how we use our IT infrastructures to interact with each other. Um, but of course, uh, there is nothing better than having a coffee and discuss a topic quickly, especially if, if there is a lot of confusion around about what's actually what holds or what is what was said and whatnot. So, um, or if you're just unsure and, and you need to kind of get a feel for, for your, um, for to, to, to kind of uh, order the information that you, that you, that you receive from, from your um, discussion partner. So it also happens that people just walk up to your desk and ask a question or you pass by um, in the hallway and you say, oh yeah, we did this and this, can you do um, next day, whatever. You know, so it's quite informal. Also, you you are able to to drop into the management's office. So I'm not talking about my first level manager, my boss, if you want so, but I'm talking about his boss. <laughs> uh, I mean, there is nothing. He doesn't kind of object if you drop in, knock, and say, "Yeah, can we have a 10 minute discussion about the technical issue?" or um, project related issue that we have so I think there's quite some good interaction in that way okay thank you um, were there any special moments you want to mention that you had during your two years so far <laughs> yeah I think some of them you already kind of got with the earlier questions um, Ah, actually, um, just one, what is it, one month ago? I'm not sure anymore, but some time ago, 
not lately, uh, not far off. Um, there has been a product launch with another pixel shifting thing, but this time a, a, a really, really, really small guy. So it's um, as big as your um, toe, uh, as your fingernail of your little finger, and has been quite challenging. Um, it is still challenging. Um, but our customer actually launched uh, the projector, so it's a projector that can fit into your um, pocket. You can essentially carry it around. It's not high-end, high-lumen, whatever, high-resolution projector. I mean, you cannot expect this of something this small. But um, I think it could be interesting, um, or it's kind of rewarding to see that you enabled, if you want so, to for this projector to even exist in this quality, in this uh, in this way. So, yeah, as I said, lately um, the customer actually launched the the project. Maybe you remember also some, or maybe I uh, hope you had some successes with, with the team, but <laughs> do you remember some, uh, or how do you celebrate success with the team? Let's put it like that. Yeah, sure. I mean, thing is, um, we have short development cycles. I mean, three quarter of a year from initial idea to mass production is not too bad. But I mean, since when you're ready for mass production, your customer might again not be and delay and whatnot. So since I'm only working here two years, it took me a bit of time to um, to start off, if you want. So I mean, you won't start your first week and be laden with responsibility and. Uh, um, here you go. This is the this is the new product we want to develop. Um, you're responsible to find the solution. Um, so we actually didn't have this many close projects. It only starts now that I'm seeing the big effects of um, of what we what we achieved during the last one and a half years. Um, but yeah, we, we have the odd milestone that we reached. Say we, we got the approval by customer that our product is fine and it's working and as if we wouldn't have known, but <laughs> still good to hear. And um, yeah, then you get the, we have, I think, a special HR budget for this um, to yes. accommodate for, for um, a grill party outside on our terrace with the whole project team. Um, or to just go somewhere, have a, a grub and a beer and celebrate. Good. Um, yeah, we've stayed quite positive so far. Maybe uh, how can Obsetune as an employer improve, according to your opinion? <laughs> Everywhere, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, I mean, it's, as I said, it's difficult to Judge really, uh, I can only tell from what I perceive when speaking or exchanging with um, colleagues from from the study time a, a bit. I mean, everybody has issues or not issues, sees potential for improvement with, with employers. I mean, it's nothing um, that is uh, not uh, a topic, if you want so. Um, to me, the probably the most um, challenging one and the most important one also if, if we want to grow with OptoTune. Um, you saw Mark Venturi earlier, I mean, does he look old? Not really. I mean, he's still in his 30s, if I'm not mistaken. So you can imagine it's quite a young company. Loads of the guys, they, they do have uh, experience um, and they do have best practice knowledge and whatnot, but it's still a startup in, in some regards. So there is this advantage of having close communication cycles and short communication cycles, and you can you can take over ownership and do decisions yourself. You, you can come up with solutions also to, to internal processes yourself. You're actually asked to improve how OptoTune works and whatnot. But um, oftentimes this is out of a need to improve because there is simply no process around. And I think this is something that we need to work on if we, if we want to grow because right now we are a good 100 people. I'm not sure what um, the exact number is at the moment, 
Um, at 80, but... Um, 180, we'll okay. <laughs> this land is 120. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and I mean, there is there is potential around that we could grow to, I don't know, 1,000 within a few years' time. If, if one market picks up, like, automotive or ARV or, or whatever, this can go really fast. And right now, we need to prepare for this. Else we're gonna be really, really lost if we don't do. So setting up processes, um, make rules, more rules. Yeah. Such that they're still smart, such that you're still fast, but you're just this bit more structured, you know. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, these were the questions I had in mind. Um, thank you very much, Miki. Um, I hope it was uh, interesting to get an insight here about his uh, daily life. Uh, so I open up the rounds. Maybe you have also questions to Michi or uh, a general question came up to your mind in the meantime. Um, one quick question. Um, we heard about your uh, your activities every day. And from, from what I heard, it seems like you don't have to do very much uh, with optics or are you dealing a lot with optics? Yes, I am in a sense. I mean, I'm not running the C-Max models. For this, we really have optics engineers as well. Mm -hmm. um, but what I, for example, have to do, I have to specify um, flatness tolerances or, and whatnot according to ISO standards. So I have to understand what those standards mean and what the effect for the customer also is. I mean, um, when we have a customer meeting like this afternoon, there will be a topic about, okay, what can we achieve? What is what is really vital for your for your overall system? How, what what does our optics need to fulfill in order to to not kind of have detrimental effects on, on your overall performance? So um, in this regards, there is some contact with optics, but you're right. It's not it's not a, a, an everyday day in day out um, opportunity to, to work with it. Um, yeah, I mean we, we also do have test systems, for example, where you where I'm responsible for one test setup that we have for for outgoing quality control, and there you have lasers, you have your or you have to do tour labs orders, so you kind of. Although um, you might not be within the field of optics when coming from studies, you have the opportunity here to actually learn it. We also have, um, did we record it actually last time? Uh, like uh, opto academy um, training sessions, like one, two hour uh, sessions where, for example, an optic expert has a, um, a lecture about wavefront errors and um, how to, to model um, optical effects and whatnot. Um, this way, when you start here, you will need to learn about optics and also to some degree deeper or shallower. But um, yeah, what I wanted to say is probably, I mean, we have the, the optical component. As Mark said, it's a static thing and we need to get it moving. So the static thing has been around for quite a while. It's well known how to define it. There is well known suppliers for it. The, you have measurement equipment for it and whatnot. And say this is probably not even 50% of your job to get this right. The much bigger load is actually on how to move this gun, how to move the optic. So there is much more um, task around uh, as well for mechanical engineering and electrical engineering to, to build actuators out of this. Maybe it's also a good point. Um, as far as I know, you are in the optical actuators area. Maybe I yep. can give you also a little bit crisp how we um, separate our products. So we have really the, the lenses, which are our liquid products because they have liquid inside and we have the optical um, actuator area where we have all the other three product types which um, Mark showed, like beam shift shifting, beam steering um, or laser type reducers. Um, Michi works on this. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but I think especially in the lens department, 
optics is probably even more important than new. We all it's all optical components, all four. Um, but I think it lends there is more optics. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Um, thanks a lot for the interview. Uh, quite interesting. Um, I have a question. So you said that the production is in Slovakia. So do you need to travel to kind of to Slovakia often to kind of check the line or the specifications? Um, we have the production for the optical actuators as Mark, uh, sorry, Adrian just said uh, in Slovakia. So. This is kind of our division's production, if you want so. And then here in Switzerland, we do all the lenses because they tend to be, I'm not 100% convinced, but they tend to be a bit more complicated to produce. There's more knowledge involved on the process side also, since we do much more components ourselves and not just assemble them. Um, so traveling there, yes. Um, Usually this only takes place when you um, develop when you developed something to a good degree. You showed that you can produce it here in Switzerland, and then you kind of set up the line or let them set up the line, and you go over there and you kind of check that everything is running fine initially. Once this handover is done. Um, then usually we don't tend to um, to to mix in too much because it's also their responsibility to keep it running. Um, and we probably have to distinguish as well whether you um, would apply for a product development engineer or a process engineer. So as a product development engineer, it's really more this initial handover. Um, where you also yeah, have more of the uh, really introduction to the to the test system for optical quality control or outgoing quality control. And as a process engineer, it might happen that you have to go more regularly because then you might, might also be tasked to improve something which is already running in a sense. Did this answer your question? So for me, within these two years, I've been once to Slovakia. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe just a question out of curiosity. How did the Corona crisis kind of influence your work? Um, good questions. Maybe I can also answer this because I was in the pandemic team. So we, we did a task force uh, with four people. Um, and Michi also mentioned already some things from the IT infrastructure. So we, of, I mean, all the people we joined production, um, they of course need to keep, uh, need to stay in production because they do manual work. Um, there we did a, a separation into two groups to lower the risk when one group gets infected. Um, that we can still keep up production. I think this was, of our, as a manufacturing company, one of our main topics we needed to guarantee that we that production is running. Um, it's also important to say we, we, ne we never had a case, any corona case in Opportune. That's also very good. Um, and of course, the other people uh, which could work from home, they just did work from home. And this was actually very impressive um, how everything continued. Um, so we really could continue our projects and uh, things were finished and I think also the, the managers were quite surprised that everything went so well. So a good proof of concept I would say. Um, and of course there is like these things between like the maybe Michi as well, which is more crisp there where we had like the people working in the lab as well and in the lab we need to also go there sometimes and same time we can do a lot of things on the computer and of course we did all this um yeah the safety rules um we did a lot of like we put places where you can sit that there is distancing given and we give a lot of advice we even created a, a sharepoint where can people check um how they should behave within optotune um how they should do on use use all these tools how home office is done best for example um, 
next to having this disinfection and stuff and everything. Um, not using lifts, like restrictions within the kitchen that you don't touch the same things. So we did it quite strict because it was very important for us to, to keep running as a company. And yeah, I would say from my perspective, it went quite surprisingly well. Yeah. We can add up here a little bit. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, as Adrian just said, it kind of was no issue to do to, to home office. Um, impact otherwise. Um, I don't know whether your question is also geared towards the business side of life. Um, I think this is, yeah, we we cannot answer everything, but uh, say, um, for example, we have customers as you see in around the globe, and you can imagine, or or the suppliers around the globe. So when the virus started off in China, we actually faced quite some issue with our Chinese suppliers. Um, I mean, first of all, there has we, we know there's Chinese New Year, so we always have to plan ahead um, to get the components in ahead of time, ahead of this Chinese New Year's time. But then when we kind of plan to be up and running after this again and to receive um, glasses and PCBAs and whatnot, and this kind of uh, was a difficult time initially. Then, um, and obviously, once China has been back, <laughs> our customers shut down uh, their factory, for example, in France and the US and whatnot, uh, and we, we got a decrease in, in sales. And um, but yeah, I mean, we as a as a um, I don't know the proper English word, um, but we kind of, or we don't produce raw components ourselves, and we don't sell um, overall finished goods ourselves. So we we, um, we we always act as an intermediary between the two. And I mean, of course, this is uh, something that is difficult um, when first your supplier is off and then your customer is off. So. Uh, I have a question. I'm still joining from the train, so I hope <laughs> you still hear me well. Um, so, how are the new product ideas created? So, is it more of an intrinsic um, um, idea, say, the company has, um, we want to go there and there and develop a new product, or is it more the customers that um, come to you with a need? Um, it Maybe goes both ways. It goes both ways. Um, I'm not in sales, so I might have a bit of a shifted perception there. But as far as I'm concerned, it's often the case that we identify a problem or a solution to a problem that we think certain customers have. And we kind of try to show them that we could offer a solution for this. But we don't develop something on our own and push a final product to the market. This is not what we would do. We, we will always uh, try to develop together with the customer. Um, so, but there is there's certainly also the case that customers approach us and say, yeah, look, we have this problem. Can you offer us a solution for, for it? So I think this is what I mean with both ways, um, that we also identify problems that our customers might know or solutions to problems that our customers might not be aware of. Um, so it's quite often that we do NRE projects um, together with customers, um, and I think it's yeah to, to give a number. I think ninety percent of our products were developed together with with customers and not um, in our own little to ivory tower and then pushing <laughs> it out. You know. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, and, and maybe to follow up on this, so if you have those NRE projects, uh, to what extent is is the development fully on your side? So say, uh, do you only produce or develop the optical and actuator part, or do you also maybe develop uh, hardware, firmware all around the system? Or is it, so is it the final system, is it really working just because of your um, part of Optotune, or is it really a joint project with the customers? How much hardware, software do you do? Not you personally. Yeah, as often, as often the, <laughs> our products are integrated into a much bigger system. It, it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't make sense that we develop the hardware to 
mass production level. What we tend to do is, since we also need to be able to drive those actuators ourselves, um, we tend to develop a like a subset of a um, of a system to to drive it. And we, from this experience, we then tell our customers on what they might want to implement on, on their integrated system then, if you want to. Yeah, I think it was very interesting also the, the format like with question Q&A. And maybe you, one kind of question from my side. Um, what do you think is like the toughest part in your job in terms really of like intellectual challenge? Okay. Um... I did not study electronics engineering, so I struggle with this, but this is my personal um, <laughs> issue as a product development engineer. Um, other than that, it's often times actually how to, how to solve something efficiently and reliably. If you, yeah, it's probably difficult to grasp, but say if you have a a sensor system and you design it on paper and you don't yet know how it's gonna behave in reality then I mean you can do a bit of guesstimation um, you can apply some best practice you can apply physical laws whatnot but I mean you're not able often not able to do a whole master thesis out of out of a problem that you have um, so you 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 have to be a bit um, quick in thinking if you want so you have to have to know what you're doing and you have to kind of uh, yeah you have to pull all 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 drawers kind of of your engineering knowledge if you want so so you have to be really diverse in thinking in this way I think this is an intellectual challenge I mean, we're not doing um, um, rocket science, although we build rockets <laughs> occasionally <laughs> for our f uh, for fun. But I mean, it's 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 not as if if we if we would do um, how to how to tell this. Uh, how, I mean, we don't produce papers if you want. So we we. We don't do the probably as deep science as you would do in a PhD. So you you have to be a bit of um, practical and pragmatic in some ways. But I think it's as an intellectual challenge to actually be pragmatic and be um, kind of broad in your thinking and and on, on how to combine knowledge. So to me, this is the intellectual challenge. Okay, and. Are also deadlines there is an issue, or um, usually oh, make sure constantly. to? Okay. <laughs> I mean, time is limited. Yeah, um, of course, course, resources are always limited. Um, so this is something. Um, yeah, I think you have to deal with everywhere. Um, so yes, I mean, especially with customer projects, if we if we agreed on a project plan. Um, Mm, and you were not part of the planning phase, and then you then you see what you have to achieve in what time. It's uh, often can be difficult, especially if you have the source in parts as well, and whatnot that you know that have a certain lead time. Um, if you, I mean, it's often, and then you you know you have the, another project, very important project that runs along and kind of competes with with the deadline that you now have. But this is always a um, uh, discussion with the project manager then and your and, and, the, and your team lead and whatnot on how to set priorities. Um, I mean, as a as a young company and uh, I mean, one of the values is ownership. So you, if there is much on your desk, um, it might happen that you stay a little bit later in the evening in order to get something done. You'd compensate for this at a given time, might not be 
in the near future often if there's a really I mean if there's a sprint in a project in order to get a, a deadline to meet the deadline um, so there is a certain uh, need to also be efficient say which is okay because only then you do you run uh, profitable <laughs> I mean, we all need to earn money in, at the end of the day I also like it when I have a bit, uh, a bit of money on my bank account, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe, maybe one question from my side. Um, in your um, project team or, or in your uh, development group, um, with what kind of engineers or, or oh, other people yeah. are involved in, in this project? Good question. We, we didn't talk about this. That's true. Um, so we usually have a dedicated mechanical engineer that is um, doing all the process equipment um, where it get really hairy where you have to use many standard components like linear rails and uh, whatnot um, that you just have to know how to, to kind of achieve your your um, functionality the most efficient so building a machine essentially production machine so this is uh, uh, that that then um, is used for the mass production uh, of your product. So this is the, the mechanical engineer, the typical mechanical engineer. Then you have the product development engineer. That this is my role, um, where you kind of interface with many of them, um, probably more than with um, other engineering roles. Um, and your main responsibility would be to um, to achieve the target specifications of your product and this also includes the price and processability and whatnot that it's running stable that you have a test system that actually um, shows you the right values and uh, that you need to know and you kind of have to interact a lot with all the engineers but also with the uh, sales department and with production and supply chain and whatnot because you need to order in all those parts that enable you to build a sample the first sample and there's a process engineer um, which is mainly concerned in kind of interacting then with the mechanical engineer for the production machine and the and me as the product development engineer of having features that help him actually process the parts in a meaningful way to build, to assemble something. So this is the process engineering task. Um, we do have, I think it's not in the job role description anymore, but we do have kind of a test engineer that then is really dedicated to setting up a, a test system environment in order to, to assess your quality, your performance specs before shipping to the customer. So those are the four engineering roles. We do have a specialty department for materials um, where you kind of have to go and request um, certain work packages if you have an issue with one of your products and or, or they do develop certain broader uh, more company-wide technologies um, internal processes as well um, process technologies uh, on their own so this is kind of the, the engineering we have. And of course, there is the whole electronics department. Thing is um, that electronics firmware and software is mostly in, in Slovakia. So we do have all the software engineers there for sure. We do have all the firmware engineers there for sure. Um, and we do have also the hardware engineers. So the electronics engineers, if you want so. But we have to do development here in Switzerland as well. And this is where we have um, a smaller amount, but we still ha do have electronics engineers in Switzerland. They're not doing uh, design work with Altium or Eagle, or r r rather rarely say. It's not their job like with the technical drawer or whatnot to, to sit um, eight hours in front of CAT, so they're not sitting eight hours in front of Altium, of an eCAT uh, software solution. Um, but they're rather here to, to kind of interface with um, all, the others all the other engineers that I mentioned earlier, and also to kind of specify 
a bit to our Slovakian colleagues um, on what they need to do and uh, also check on them uh, that they're or um, say not check on them but um, review their designs and whatnot so this is the engineering roles okay thank you good then i i would say i will um finish up i really enjoyed it There's many many thanks all for your active um questions it was really nice we tried to give you like a, a industry insight um very practical even if you don't want to work for Optotune, that you at least can um, take something with you and have a, had an interesting two hours. And if you want to work for Optotune somewhere, um, at the moment we just have a spontaneous application open which you, where you can apply, um, that we have your CV and of course we also can note that we have a talk together. Um, and there is an also an internship um, in materials area um, open at the moment. And anyway, I'll be happy to stay in contact with you. And of course, also happy for your feedback. If we do something like that, um, maybe next year or someone else again, um, let us know now. It would be very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, thank you for from my side for attending. It has been a few really interesting questions. I think I also got to think a bit about um, um what we do every day uh, here um interesting perspective as well um yeah maybe from my side it was very uh, insightful and valuable because i think this format was quite unique i have not uh, participated in anything similar to this and yeah like michi just said it, uh, it's a unique possibility to ask uh, questions directly to persons joining online uh, who work in the company without going to any fair, which would not be possible at all right now. So thank you very much, uh, all of you, for organizing. Thank you very much. Then I would end here the video. And of course, I'm happy to hear from you um, by email or uh, follow us on LinkedIn or if you, um, just apply. Be nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye.